her up. Yeah, there we go. All right, welcome back, everybody. We have big news on the coaching front for college basketball where our West Virginia Mountaineers have hired Darian DeVries, the head coach at from Drake, which coincidentally, Dylan, by the way, welcome back onto the show to talk about this. Coincidentally, we said, what, like a week and a half ago that that was the name to keep an eye on, and here we are. Yep, that was our not Dar- By the way, I wanted to get this clear. Not Darian DeVry, Darian DeVries, although I like DeVry better. Right, yeah, we, we fuddled that a little bit uh, last week. But uh, yeah, as the last Friday, that was our prediction to get everyone, you know, kind of angled that way. And, you know, some of the other names, you know, Mark Bainton that we had said to keep an eye on were names that were on the board until the the 11th hour. And uh, some of the other names at other schools that we were worried about didn't pan out, I think, in the way that we had predicted, but it still let. Ren Baker get his guy, which he doesn't seem to miss on very often. Yeah, so let, let's talk about that. We said that, you know, we were probably the fourth best opening this cycle. I think we both would have said Ohio State and Michigan were better openings, and Louisville were better openings than West Virginia. Mm-hmm. And I thought Dusty May was probably going to be the top candidate on the market. And he was. I, I didn't expect Ohio State to go with the interim coach, but I'm not all that surprised. He did a pretty good job. And then, you know, it's been basically who's going to get Dusty May. And then Michigan, you know, we're recording this on Sunday night. On Saturday night, the news broke that he went to Michigan, even though all indicators seem to be that he was heading to Louisville. So it got really interesting. Right. Yeah. There were some insiders in Louisville who said that there were press conference stages and press conference seats being unfolded by the support staff at the Yum Center. And that was about an hour or two before the news broke in Ann Arbor. So there are some uh, questionable uh, reactions going on from Louisville fans. But I think the reasoning that you got from people with knowledge of Dusty May's thinking is that Louisville is just such a mess right now. And Michigan has a better kind of supporting infrastructure when it comes to involvement of alumni. Although Juwan Howard being an alumni, I'm not sure too many people are hot on the alumni market for Michigan at the moment. But, you know, they have a better NIL kind of structure set up. And there's just a lot of baggage to overcome, I think, in Louisville right now that, Dusty May saw a tougher rebuild no matter where he went than he probably had at FAU with, you know, the expectation level at wherever he was going to land. But I think Michigan gives you a better ability to do it quickly. Yeah. So, but let's talk about the last couple of days for us because, you know, so uh, Rim Baker, our athletic director said at like, really like the day after the season, which was a disaster, you know, that we're opening up a coaching search. And I really didn't know where we were going to go. I was still kind of in the, I really want Dusty May camp. I had heard Mark Byington's name. I don't remember exactly when Darian DeVries' name came up. I don't remember his name coming up last summer. Like some of these names I remember coming up in the summer. And I was kind of like, eh, I don't know. Then I remember you sending me an article in February talking about, you know, top 10 candidates for the West Virginia job. Mark Byington was on the uh, list, which we'll get to here in a bit. And I don't remember DeVries being on that one either. Do you? I, you know, I think we, we kind of racked our brains on that last week. And I didn't go back to kind of double check, you know, some sources, which finding ones from last month will be hard to come by with the amount of momentum that's been around the search lately, but I don't think DeVries was in the early, you know, in the early discussions, he didn't really come up until you and I really kind of started kicking around names right around the last week of the regular season. He did eventually come up. And I remember when he came up because I'd said, you know, several times, like, you know, 
how much I wanted Dusty May. And then the other names really didn't do much, like especially Martin Byington, you know, he, you know, good for him getting a win in the NCAA tournament against Wisconsin and turning James Madison around. It didn't do a whole lot for me. That was his first NCAA tournament appearance as what a head coach for 11 seasons. Yeah, he'd been at it a while. And then I think the thing that really turned him off for me and I imagine potentially Ren Baker is Byington being, and I think we discussed this last week, very openly hesitant to involve the portal in building a program, which fantastic, you know, strategy when he was an early coach, you know, a decade or so ago, but that's not the way that you're going to turn around jobs quickly. Byington's a great long-term hire, great at the mid-major level, not I'm not sure he's a high major guy just yet until he figures out working the portal. At so least yeah, in some capacity. His name had come up and I remember Kyle Smith's name coming up, coming up. Who's the head coach at Washington state. Although it sounds like he's now going to head over to Stanford, but mm, yep. eventually I did see DeVries' name and I was like, huh, Drake, like that resonated with me. Cause I knew that they made the tournament this year and I was like, didn't they make the tournament the previous year? So I looked him up and just the more I looked at his resume, I was like, I really want this guy. Like, and I think this is a realistic option. And by the way, Ren Baker just tweeted it and the men's basketball team just uh, Twitter account just tweeted it. So he is our coach. Yeah. And I think, you know, that was a name that again, like when you initially said, Hey, look at Darian DeVries. I said, Okay, like, you know, Drake, I was like, all right, I've been watching Drake, you know, last couple of years, never really put, you know, thought to mind about him. And then you look, and he fits very much, and I know I mentioned this last week, very much in the mold of a Mark Kellogg that Ren Baker got to lead the women's basketball program. And he's done a, a great guy job. And fantastic job, first coach in mm -hmm. program history, albeit a limited number of coaches, I think only six all time but the first guy to ever win in a NCAA tournament game in year one under the West Virginia women, which is, a, you know, I'm all about winning games in March. You, you and I both know that, that that's what matters. Well, as much, look, as much as I like Mike Carey, that was one thing he couldn't do. Right. And like, you just look at the, the trend and even, you know, DeVries, you know, we'll kind of dig into his, yeah, personality as we get to know him better as a fan base seems like a you know stand up guy you know a lot of athletic kids uh, you know from him and his wife very athletic family so he's used to being around winning you know he grew up you know out there in Iowa and believe it or not you know there's a portion of the fan base for West Virginia that were looking for any reason find anyone who'd ever been friends with Bob Huggins or bring Bob Huggins back. I have that portion of the fan base, a little tidbit that, you know, might sway some of them. Darian DeVries, thousand point scorer at Northern Iowa in the late eighties, early nineties, who was coached by, I uh, have to double check the name here because I kept it up just for this occasion. So, yeah, I, I do have his Wikipedia here. I don't know where he played. He, or, I'm he, sorry, at UNI. Yeah, played at UNI 94 to 98, 41% three point shooter, coached by Eldon Miller, who, if you dig deep enough, was at one time the head coach at Ohio State. Okay. okay. And brings on a young Bob Huggins as an assistant coach at Ohio State. Okay. So there's your Bob Huggins connection for that portion of the fan base looking for any reason to like Darian DeVries. So, yeah, while we're on the subject, let's go ahead and break it down. I have his Wikipedia page here. So from I uh, born in a native of, I'm sorry, Applington, Iowa, Applington. Made it, uh, <laughs> Northern Iowa, uh, was an assistant coach at Creighton for about uh, 18 seasons under both Dana Altman, who is the current head coach at Oregon, and Greg McDermott, who's the current coach still at Great or at Creighton. 
uh, takes over the head coaching job at Drake, which is also there in Iowa, where he wins 150 games in six seasons, 24, 20, 26, 25, 27, 28 are his win totals uh, in those six seasons. And by the way, this is a program that hadn't won, I think, over 18 games in the previous decade, zero NCAA tournament appearances, and, you know, 150 Include, wins. Yeah, go ahead. Including under, uh, you know, one of the other candidates for the West Virginia opening who made it to the second or third round of interviews in Nico Medved. Yeah. It was the previous so Medved took over, was at that program, either got fired, left, I don't know. Left, he just took the CSU job. Okay. And uh, now I forgot his name. DeVries took over and, you know, inherited a keys to a Ferrari. I don't know, but did well. His son looks like a stud and then has three NCAA tournament appearances in four years. I'll tell you what, man. I think there are two things on this resume if you really want to nitpick. And one doesn't bother me a, a ton. The other one you could maybe argue bothers, you, you know, you or me you know, other fans, but the only, there, there are only two complaints. One, he's never worked like on the East coast, which, you know, basically West Virginia is on the East coast. He's a Midwest guy. Could he be a cultural fit? I don't know. Only worked in Iowa. You know, I, I could see what I could be red flags. And then second, he has zero wins in the NCAA tournament. He's 0 three. The second, the latter there with NCAA tournament wins doesn't really bother me. What about you? Yeah, I think if you give, you know, given the win percentage being north of 700, I think you give guys like that enough chances, the wins in March are going to come. And especially if you give him, you know, the NIL backing and, you know, other supporting infrastructure that he's going to have in Morgantown, I think he's going to have no problem getting, you know, the resources that he needs to win in March. And the strategy is really what I'm looking for in guys like that. And if you can win 28 games at Drake, I think you can win 23, 24 in Morgantown consistently. And the cultural fit is, you know, the, the thing that intrigues me a little bit. And I know you and I had some discussions in the last 24 hours or so. And I don't think that it may end up coming open. But the job that would have kept him away from Morgantown is if Iowa moves on. Yeah. from McCaffrey and I think that's a job that he wouldn't have said no to at even the slightest and it would fit in well now be it the big 12 being geographically disparate as it is I think having a midwest guy could be not as much of a cultural misfit as a lot of people are going to look at because you're not trying to recruit New Jersey in New York like you were in the big east days you're looking for guys that can recruit texas that can recruit kansas and get those kind of you know off the radar guys that bill self seems to find from some podunk town in iowa that the kid shoots 75 percent in high school from three you know just like you know kind of in a grady dick kind of mold where it's like all right who would have pick that guy as a D1 athlete, and then you put Grady Dick on draft boards. That's fair. <clears throat> you know, uh, wanting to recruit Big 12 territory in, instead of the East Coast. I get that. Uh, but, man, I, I don't know where – like, if you have an issue with this hire, I don't know what it could be outside of – Yeah. You just well, want someone from West Virginia who we both are in the camp of – it doesn't matter. You don't have to be a West Virginia native, which, by the way, I'm going to go on a rant here. And I, I think I talked about this with you last night. I definitely talked about it with my dad and my brother. We've gone through two big coaching searches in the last five years, football and basketball. And in both searches, let me start with football. You can say what you want about Neil Brown right now. But in 2019, he was one of, if not the top guy on the market for Power 5 programs if you were looking to elevate for, uh, someone from the group of five. And he turned down Power 5 jobs, multiple, according to him. I don't know how true it is, but according to him, 
before we came up. And now, granted, we came up in a little bit later in the cycle because Dana Holgerson coached the bowl game, which was around December 28th, and then left for Houston. And we were able right. to scoop up Neil Brown after he had already passed on some jobs. So that's a little, little bit of an outlier. But still, like he had turned them down to stay at Troy. And I'm going to tell you, as someone who grew up in Alabama, Troy is in the middle of nowhere, Alabama. Yeah. And he chose to come to Morgantown. And he's a guy I pointed to, much like Darian DeVries with this hire, like that's a guy I want because he was from Kentucky. Granted, he he's more of a cultural fit, I think, than DeVries might be. But All right. I would agree. That, still, a top candidate. This basketball cycle, you could argue Dusty May was probably the top candidate. But DeVries was what, second? Well, and just look, think, think of it this way. How many other jobs, and I, you know, you, you talked me a little bit away from the ledge this afternoon and said, all right, we knew it was coming today. We all thought it was coming today. I'm texting you at 4 p.m. Mountain Time. No, going, no, you, what's you're texting what's me, happening? I think, <laughs> later than that. I, I, I think it was, let me look at my phone here, because Snapchat does show you the messages. Uh, uh, but again, so you, uh, you and I... Me, No, so you texted me at around five, okay, so five o'clock, four o'clock your time. Okay, you're right. Saying no DeVries news has me wondering if something is up. Within an hour, I think an hour on the dot, pretty much. Mm -hmm. he, yeah. This is when the news breaks that he's coming to WVU. It's funny how yeah, that works. But I, yeah, you, but that was the thing where, it, like, if it, if you're going after a guy that no one else wants, you don't get those. You know, those nerves. And I remember you and I talking back in 2019, be like, Neil Brown's a guy that other people wanted and we got him. Okay. You know, that's. I thought, honestly, in 2019, like, when Neil Brown uh, came up for some jobs, Louisville opened up that year. He's from Kentucky. I thought he was going to get that job. Yeah. But and then this you, was before we knew Dana was leaving. And I was like, we're going to stick with Dana. Like, I, it wasn't even in the back of my mind that we could potentially get Brown. Right, that we weren't even looking at a cycle like yeah. we were even thinking. And then, so, if, and then you look at that now where guys like, you know, if you put the five guys that everybody is, is thinking about was Dusty May, was Darian DeVries, Beington was up for a lot of jobs just with the JMU connection, and, you know, Medved getting a lot of looks at, you know, some other places and a guy like Danny Sprinkle is probably the five guys that that everyone at the top of the board is looking at. And to have the guy that's like, okay, if you're not getting Dusty May, who do you get? Because, you know, a lot of the jobs that are open, you know, like jobs like Washington and Stanford, they know they're not getting Dusty May. So they're moving on to other guys down the list. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Oklahoma State, you know, if Iowa comes open, like those are jobs that, guys like DeVries are going to want and when you go onto the message boards in the last you know hour and a half that you and I have been all over when you have Iowa State fans who are very familiar with Drake as a program well, I, I, believe I could say 75 percent like DeVries Osberger. comes from uh, Creighton maybe but he definitely comes from the McDermott coaching tree I did read that yeah, so they they know what the guys in Morgantown are getting, and I can tell you, seventy five, eighty percent of the Iowa State fans that I've seen in the last couple hours, they're not happy about this hire because they know what it means. And if you get guys from the state of Iowa who have followed his career for the last twenty years, they're like, okay, this DeVries cat's pretty high on the list. You're getting a good one. I think that should calm a lot of nerves in Morgantown that you're we're replacing a you know Hall of Famer with a good one. So anyway, back to what I was ranting about. I hope that the hiring of Brown, again, say what you want about him now, but there's no denying he was a top guy on the market. Darian DeVries was probably a top two, maybe even top one guy on the market this year. We get them both. Not, neither have West Virginia connections. They're just top candidates who respect the institution and are like, that's a job I want. 
this should really shut up the fans that think we should we can we can and should only hire West Virginia either West Virginia natives or people with a West Virginia connection. Like, I, just shut up for the foreseeable future. You you've been proven yeah. wrong here. Yeah, I think that's and you know, me having grown up in the shadow of Morgantown since the day I was born. I understand that culture and I understand getting defensive when anytime someone says something negative about West Virginia and you want it, it's like, all right, if you're going to come at my, my home, those are fighting words. And those, you know, that's the, that's that portion of the fan base that I have a very deep connection with. But if you want to win and we can, you know, complain all the time, like, oh, we don't have any national championships. We haven't played for the national title since Jerry West. You know, you know, let's get back to the 50s and 60s. Look at Fred Schaus's resume. He wasn't a Mountaineer. Through and through, he has some connections, deep connections. Well, yeah, what, I, what was he, a coach? I know the name. Yeah, he was He was the coach in, in the Hot Rod, Hunley, yeah. Jerry West era. If you go deep into his resume, he wasn't, he wasn't, he didn't play for Morgantown High and High School and you know, come up. Like, he was a guy that they brought in. He was a Southern guy, you know, came up, just got the job and it was open. If you want to win at the highest level, I mean, if you look at like, you know, guys like Nick Saban, kind of that coaching nestle around Fairmont of all the national championships, which are, mm-hmm. albeit mostly just Nick Saban. But, you know, there's coaching talent in West Virginia, but it doesn't always mean that that's the best guy every time that you're going to find. And, Guys that fit culturally, they're gonna they're gonna find that that kinship. You know, our feelings about the state of Kentucky. You know, Brown's a Kentuckian. You know, culturally he fits well. He understands that blue collar mentality. Well, look, look Appalach- Appalachia is not the only place where blue collar fits. And I think a guy coming from the MVC like Darian DeVries, who understands that it's just gonna take hard work sometimes. I don't think he's afraid of that, and I think that's what. A lot of people need to look at that instead of what zip code is credit card bills coming to right now. I totally agree. Like, I think culture matters in college sports more than professional sports by a mile. Like, 100%. not even a mile, longer than that. Like, it, it truly does matter. There are some exceptions out there where that's not the case. But, you know, Brown is a cultural fit. I don't think the Midwest isn't a cultural fit to West Virginia. West Virginia is just kind of a weird state. It's not, it, it's more Southern than anything else. You know, we're, yeah, we're I mean, I've always, Southern. I've always, I've, you know, jokingly said, you know, yeah, like it's also, you, you know, divide, divide the state of West Virginia south of uh, Clarksburg and call it, you know, that's in the south. Yeah. You know, Morgantown's, you know, more mid Atlantic. Yeah. than anything but you know culturally we identify with kind of those southern roots it's just a but. weird state the eastern panhandle is what like an hour and a half from washington dc yeah that's it's commutable drive the northern panhandle is a hop skip and a jump literally from ohio the midwest morgantown is a hop skip and a jump from pennsylvania the southern coal fields are you can get to north carolina from the southern coal fields in just a couple hours. I have driven from Morgantown to Char, uh, not Charleston, more from Morgantown to Charlotte, North Carolina, in under six hours. Yeah, it's longer to get from Birmingham, Alabama, to Charlotte, North Carolina, than it is from Morgantown to Charlotte. That blows my friends' minds when I tell them that. Yeah, it's you know it's a, it's just a weird anomaly. state. Like it, 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 we have a culture. I don't, it's hard to describe. We're just more Appalachian, like, and the North doesn't want to claim us. The South doesn't want to claim us. We're just there. And we're also just a river away from the Midwest, which is where DeVries is coming from. Right. And I think, you know, you look at even, you know, other programs, coincidentally enough, that are open this cycle, Michigan having that Michigan man kind of culture for a long time. Like, yeah, that worked very well with with bringing Harbaugh back and you know Shen Beckler being there for you know a very very long time but they're not afraid to deviate from that too much I just want a good I just want a good candidate so I again I went on a rant there but 
I hope this shuts those fans up. And I know, like, in five years, the Iowa job is probably going to come open, and you're going to hear DeVries' name. Let's just assume he does well. And then let's pretend he goes to Iowa. Like, okay, deal with it. Like, that's home, man. What? That's just going home. Right. Yeah, and, and that's I don't think it, Iowa's a better job than West Virginia in terms of basketball. I think football, yeah, but not basketball. But it's going home. Like I wouldn't blame them. And again, like yeah. we don't know that's going to happen. Or I mean, you look at it this way. Yeah, McCaffrey's pushing retirement. He retires in two years, but you know, DeVries is like, all right, I'm building something in Morgantown. I like where I'm at. Maybe he doesn't make that move or, you know, maybe Iowa, you know, does an inside hire. You know, you never know how those situations are going to shake out necessarily. And, you know, if I get a guy that's going to win me 25 games and Ren Baker's still going to be around hopefully in five years, I'll let him pick the next one. I almost prefer hiring from outside West Virginia. Yeah, I think if you find if you find the cultural fit, and it's a guy who's going to win games, Mark Kellogg, not a West Virginia guy. Like there's a lot of fan base that want to Mike carry. Is he a just Texas guy? Stay. He was at FSA. Yeah. And you know that's a guy that you and I, having kind of seen that national landscape, have a kind of a different perspective than some of the people that have never lived outside of West Virginia. Not that that's yeah, West Virginia a great place to be, but I look at resumes, and if you're gonna win me ball games, I'll support you through and through. So let's talk about uh, Rem Baker because when we hired him, you know, so we forced Shane Lines out the door in 2022, which I was on board with. I, I you know, as much as I hate to bash on a guy who's a fellow. SM grad at WVU. Right. So, sitting on the same degrees that's on you and my resume. Yeah, yep. we got to support, you know, support our, our own on that. It was clear, not that he was in over his head necessarily, but I was like, what is he doing? Like, the, the, it had run its course. Yeah. And then, you know, you and I having the connections that you and I do throughout the powers that be, the, yeah, we talk about culture and cultural fit. He's a Parkersburg guy. Yeah. He was not connecting with the people he needed to connect with anymore. No. And, you know, I, I didn't think he was an idiot. I, I just thought we could do better. And, you know, he inherited a really good situation from, from Oliver Luck. And Oliver Luck's, well, hang on. Oliver Luck left what? Like 2014? We hire Shane Lyons the next year, I think. 2015. Yeah, right around then. Yeah. Within two years of Shane Lyons' tenure in 2016, I remember the 2016 17 academic calendar year. The football team wins 10 games. The basketball team gets to the Sweet 16. The women's basketball team wins the Big 12 tournament, gets to the NCAA tournament. The women's soccer team plays for the national championship, loses, but plays for the national championship. Yeah. That was all orchestrated under Oliver Luck, in my personal opinion. And what has it been since then? The football team has kind of been middling. Not kind of, it has been. It's been middling. The men's basketball program has had some success, but not the success we were having in the Press Virginia days. The women's basketball or the women's basketball program has been pretty good. Uh, women's soccer, you know, it might just it might be time for a new coach there. Mm -hmm. Although, how are you going to move on from Nikki Izzo Brown because? She's been our first and only coach in the program and has done a sensational job. Right. And I think if you look at. Uh, oh, and by the way, Randy Mazie had us in the NCAA tournament for the first time in 20 years and that, in that same academic calendar year. Right. And I, I think, I, I think on a women's time. soccer level, I think, you know, is a Brown, I think it's really just we were a victim of our own success. And I don't know that, you know replacements needed there but i think right, the big yeah. 12 i think we motivated the big 12 to come up to our level and now that they have we've got to adjust to that i think i think we will i don't know if it's you know if it's nikki you know you and i have great relationship with her uh both of us I, you know any of the times we've ever talked to their fantastic coach and you know i think yeah you know, i mean she's could. still doing a good job but i'm like we gonna get back to that 
national championship area. I liked, I like that. Yeah. Right. I mean, I remember, I can still tell you one of the other guys that I've been blowing up you know, the last you know few days with the coaching search there. Yeah. You know, I was in a group of Mountaineers watching that game in, I believe the Hagerstown Buffalo Wild Wings, Hagerstown, Maryland, on the way back from a uh, sport management outing that we took over a Buffalo Wild Wings and uh, probably made a few few folks you know, knock over their drink uh, in that Final Four game against North Carolina back okay. then. I was wondering what sport you were going for there. No, I remember watching that in Nashville. But anyway, my point with bringing all that up, with how much success we had in that academic calendar year, that was all, in my opinion, due to Oliver Luck. And then what did Shane Lyons do from that? We really haven't done anything of significance in any sport since then. And, you know, I, I got to talking with my mom one time. This was a couple of years ago. Like, I think the year we fired, might have fired Shane Lyons. I was complaining about him. My mom was like, yeah, but he does so much for Olympic sports. I'm like, I don't give a shit about Olympic sports. That's what well, got the really, in trouble. Well, and if you look at it, really, okay, like gymnastics got marginally better. Uh, yeah. But I believe I believe Coach Butts was already on the staff under Oliver Luck, if I recall. I forget when he actually came onto the staff. But you know, the Olympic sports, I'm not sure that there was a whole lot of influence. Yeah, we built some new facilities on on, on that end, but I'm not sure that that was really Shane Lyons doing. That was something that had been needed to be done for a very long time and just happened to get done during his tenure. Because I know, you know, having, you know, like I said, grown up there, Olympic sports was someone was like, all right, if we're ever going to be good, at, you know, a wider breadth of sports, better student experience, the shell building is what it is. And you and I having some classes and stuff in there and I've been around that building that, that just needed a facelift bad. It's, you know, it's like with the football practice facility, it needed redone for a very long time that just happened to get done under Shane Lyons, but it was something that really was needed in the late nineties. Yeah. Anyway, I bring a lot up because when we hired Rim Baker, I was really excited. I was like, wow, you know, he, he's done some good work, you know, like he, he was at, uh, a lot of small schools as an athletic director. He was an assistant athletic director at some other pretty big schools. I know Memphis was one. I think Missouri was another. Yeah, but yeah, it was because they was considered to be Missouri's yeah. top target uh, in the, when their job came up and recently. And so, but he, but he had spent the last few years at North Texas. And I swear to God, the week we hired him, I was going over, I was on my way to work. I was going through candidates and I was like, who could we hire? And I was mostly just focused on guys who, like schools that were doing well at the group of five level in football and basketball. And I thought of North Texas. And I was like, you know, their football program's okay. They just made the tournament, who, by the way, under Grant McCaslin, who's now at Texas Tech. Yeah. I was like, I wonder who their AD is. And sure enough, I'm dead serious. We end up hiring him that week. Really bonkers. But I've thought, I've thought from the beginning that he knows what he's doing. He, he, he just really seems to like command a room and you're just like, Oh, we got something here. And yeah. this just shows to me that I think he's an operator. This DeVries hire. Yeah. Uh, no, that's a discussion you and I had yesterday, you know, about Ren, you know, very openly where if you look just at the different ways that he's had success, I remember when we were discussing that hire that week. So you look at you know West Virginia, you got to build that money chest mm -hmm. to be competitive, but even at the small school level, and you know he had done that through and through. as a great fundraiser, great organizer when it comes to that. Resonates with the people he needs to have a message resonate with. And you look at you know even with the baseball upgrades coming from the Kendrick family, mm -hmm. and some of the other things that he's been able to do you know, he's affecting those Olympic sports as well. And I would argue that he's setting them up for a greater level of success than than they've ever had when it comes to that, you know, takes care of the baseball hire, uh, you know, a year out, you know, under, you know, Maisie with his last year this year. Yeah, we'll see how that but, goes. 
I know you're really high on – I forget what the head – the coach's name is. Coach Saban. Yeah. We'll see how that goes. Maisie's done a great job with the baseball program. I mean, we were going – like, in – we were a cellar dweller in baseball. It was embarrassing. Right. Yeah, we were we were bad in a bad league in yeah. the old Big East. Because if you look at the historic trend of the Big East, UConn is the best – baseball program in the last decade to be at a top 25 team like their top 25 team you know perennially not a lot of postseason success but a, a good program but you know I think we, always big there was no reason why we shouldn't be better in baseball well and and if you look enough, historically but and you look at the historically baseball was you know you know coming out of the the 50s when basketball was hot that next sport when basketball kind of cooled off in, in the late 60s and 70s, mm-hmm. baseball was a dominant team nationally yep. and, you know, fell off for the better part of 50 years yep. and, you know, come back into the Big 12. And it's like, all right, well, we were the bottom half of the Big East. You're playing the Big 12, which is the second best league nationally that I would say most people would argue outside of the SEC. And it's like, you know, the SEC, I think, is a clear – clear one when it comes to baseball i would have said you know a year or two ago i would have said the sec acc maybe the pac 12 then the big 12 in baseball yeah now uh, the big, done, so yeah yep definitely the big 12 top three league when it comes to baseball and we're more competitive in the big 12 than we ever were in the big east and yeah. i think that's a credit to coach mazy and everything that you know, he's been able to do, and certainly facilities are a huge part of that, which that's something, you know, you know, to give Shane Lyons some credit, something that got done under his leadership was getting that together, albeit the groundwork laid, again, under yeah. Oliver Luck. Yeah. Anyway, just – I don't know if this gets done if Shane Lyons is in charge. I really don't. I mean, uh, I, I think, I think Mike Byington is your not. coach. What's that? I said, I think, you know, given the, you know, the way that some of the coaching hires happened under Shane Lyons, I think with the circumstances you would have seen is a lot of talk on the message boards, DeVries, you know, DeVries is a good guy. We should go after him. We're the next best job open. Then I think you see, you know, DeVries end up at Oklahoma State or, you know, one of the other kind of mid to top tier jobs takes a job that, you know, he feels is a better fit that, you know, prioritized him more. And then you get a guy like Mark Beington or, you know, Shane Lyons being a West Virginia guy, you know, he looks at some of the connections in Medved's family and you get a guy like Nico Medved, who great coach, you know, in what he's been, you know, slowly building to, but I don't think he's a guy that is a he better, I, better hire I, than, Darian DeVries will be. Yeah, again, I'm just I'm just not convinced this happens if I agree. If if Ren Baker's not in charge. I mean, he clearly had a mission. He was like, I want, I don't know if he wanted Dusty May. I would imagine he talked to him or you know, inquired. Right, he at least gave him he himself. got him a phone call. I'm sure. I'm sure Ren yeah. Baker got a phone call on the list. There. And was probably told, hey, he wants you know, probably, you know, a situation where it was make make him say no. And he right. probably knew it was going to be a no. I had a feeling it would be a no. And then it was, okay, well, then I want Darian DeVries. Because we were at a point, you know, I, I want to talk about this too. We were at a point where on Friday night or Saturday night, it was, you know, Ohio State had locked up the interim. And it was, okay, well, now it's Michigan, Louisville, and West Virginia, you know, with Oklahoma State as kind of a, di- a distant fourth. And I'd heard a lot of buzz about DeVries at Oklahoma State. I wasn't worried necessarily, but I was like, that might be a better fit for him. He's from out there. That's kind of Midwest, but we're the, we're the better job. And you even said that Oklahoma State fans were saying that we're the better job on message boards. Yeah. And it seemed like May was going to either Michigan or Louisville, and that's what ended up happening. But in the hours before that, I had kind of heard that Michigan was sniffing around DeVries. And I thought, well, well, I can't be upset if he went to Michigan. That's a big-time job. And then if Maine's up at Louisville, you know, can't blame him there. And we 
probably, but anyway, we were at a point where it was either DeVries or Byington. And I was like, you know, if it's Byington, okay, fine. That wouldn't excite me as much as DeVries does, but it was clear he had his guy in, in the crosshairs. And if this doesn't work, I'm getting Byington and I'm just going to bide my time. Right. And I think that's another thing that if you look, you know, comparing, you know, the operator that is Ren Baker, how many times do we really have backup plans? And, you know, under, under Shane Lines was like, all right, we're getting this guy that really wants the job bad or, you know, what do we do next? And, you know, you know, everybody knew going into this weekend that DeVries was the guy where they're getting him. But if not, we have Byington, you know, kind of lying in the weeds. And that's another guy that, you know, may not be our go-to top hire. But as but like a backup plan, that's not terrible. It's a solid hire. Yeah. And, you know, it's not the exciting, splashy hire that a guy like Darian DeVries is. But Mark Byington's going to win you some games. And that's, you know, what you needed to have happen. Yeah, I, just, I don't know. I really don't know the last time we had a backup plan. Because when football came open in 2019, like Neil Brown really fell in Shane Lyons' lap. Mm-hmm. Because we were so late in that cycle. It was so late. He was still available. I, I mean, I was like, how is this dude Well, so and late? I know this was a discussion that you and I had was, you know, kind of talking ourselves out of it back then was, okay why is Neil still available? And like, there was, you know, a litany of circumstances back then that I'm sure you and I are, you know, are both just misremembering five years on, but it was kind of one of those is like, okay, like, you know, he came to us, like, this is perfect, but like, you know, who else are we going to get? And that's and, another, yeah, and that was the point I was trying to make was it was really Neil Brown. And that was it. Like Luke fickle interviewed for the job. I don't know how, interested he was and the third option was tony gibson i think i heard there was another secret interview in there i don't remember who it was maybe it was lance leipold or one of those i think but it was pretty much we're either getting neil brown or we're hiring tony gibson <laughs> right that was and i didn't that want was, tony gibson well and i tell you what the the, the also not going to get a whole lot of of talking points now but it has you know, before the hire today becomes official is Ren Baker had a plan for the last nine months of what he was going to do, the kind of guys that he was watching this whole season. And I think kind of the stones that it takes to sit knowing you're looking at a 10 win season to just, you know, not try and you know pick a guy like you're not getting Darian DeVries, you're not getting even Mark Mark Byington or Medved at all last year because they were locked in on the teams that they had, knowing that they had good seasons coming up. So you're looking at a second or third tier guy to hire last summer. And he said, you know what? It's only one year. I know I can get a guy that can turn me around in 2024. So I'm gonna take the beating. And, you know, had a great, you know, Coach Eilert, fantastic job handling the situation that he was in. Not the wins that we all wanted, but the no, professionalism. But he like a professional. Yeah. Right. And that's what that's what I think Ren Baker knew he had. He's like, all right, I got a professional. I'm not going to win the Big 12 this year, but I've got a guy who can handle the heat and is willing to do so, that I trust to do so. And if he steps up and wins 20 games, I've got my guy. But if he doesn't, I know I've got a guy who can buy me 10 months, put me in the driver's seat of the cycle. I'll be one of the best jobs open, and I'm going to get a guy that's going to set me up for 5 to 10. Yeah, I mean, this went exactly as I thought it would. Like, last summer when Bob Huggins call – it what, call, it what, call it what it is. He screwed us. I love Bob Huggins. The state loves Bob Huggins. I fully believe Bob Huggins loves West Virginia. But he screwed us. He put himself before the program twice. And, you know, 
we cut him some slack with the radio situation. I'm honestly surprised he kept his job. I didn't think he should lose his job for that scenario, but I'm surprised he kept it. But the DUI, I was like, I, I think that's a fireable offense, including what we just went through. Yeah. Well, and I think you look at it too, it's like there there was the history there. Yeah. So it really wasn't, if you want to look at it this way, to not to double down, because you and I both love Hugs. I've talked to him personally off the record, you know, of several times each of us. One of my favorite human beings. And, you know, he was still, he'll, he'll go to battle for West Virginia and people are like, oh, I wonder what the NIL situation will be like after Bob Huggins. I can tell you if he's not, if he's not on us, if he's not on us another sideline next year. And, you know, I think he's looking to go coach somewhere to be impactful to young people. But when Huggins is done, you know, sitting on the stool, he's going to pull up a chair and he's going to be, you know, working the country roads trust, like putting people in a position to succeed at West Virginia. And I think that he's willing to do that even, you know, given the circumstances. But I think what really did him in was that it wasn't the first DUI. I don't know that he oh, keeps his job after a DUI. There were other instances where it, he was pulled over in Morgantown and they let him go. 100%. And you and I know both, you know, knowing the skeletons and in, in the closets that you and I are privy to, that's not an uncommon thing. As sad as it is for society, it's not an uncommon thing. And it should be an uncommon thing. And you and I would both love the world better if it was an uncommon thing. But knowing the full truth that it's not, you know, it's still for you to get caught bad enough twice that it becomes a thing. You can't have that. I remember when we hired him in, in 2000, uh, was it seven? 2007. I remember us thinking, my family members saying like, I hope he doesn't pull what he did at Cincinnati here. And for a while he didn't. I do think he kept his nose clean. But it got to a point where, you know, when you're a legend anywhere. You get comfortable. Yeah. And I fully believe that he was probably not acting right for the last couple of years, last decade, after he got that final four in 2010. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Anyway, so <clears throat> when, when we let go of him, uh, or he resigned technically, but he was going to get fired. I, I, I was said in the moment, I was like, just do an interim. We're not going to be able to get someone big. It, the, anyone who would take this job is what you said, a third tier coach who is not a long-term answer. And it's just going to put us further behind as a program. And I, I said at the time, I'm willing to take it on the chin this year. Now, don't get me wrong. There were times this year where I was like, maybe we should have hired Andy Kennedy and kept and try to keep this roster together, <laughs> which we thought last year we, were, we would have a pretty good team. I was like, maybe we should have kept hired Andy Kennedy. Well, and we'll interrupt with some more, you know, breaking news that yeah, I'm getting uh, I think a, a lot of us expect that uh, Tucker DeVries expected uh, uh, I, to I be into the portal. That I think that was an obvious one for a lot of people that he's going to get his feedback from the NBA, two-time Mountain West or Mountain Missouri Valley, Missouri Valley, Missouri Valley Conference Player of the Year, two-time defending. 21 and seven, six foot seven wing. Yeah. You know, it's a guy that you can build a roster around and guys will want to come play with. And that's what I think, you know, you and I were talking about this this morning is, you know, you needed to get a guy and, you know, that was the knock against Byington is he's afraid of the portal, doesn't like it, which, you know, I understand guys like Dabo Sweeney, Mark Byington that don't like the portal. Not a huge fan of it myself, but winning takes you just got to sometimes you got to play the game and that's the, the game that you got to play a little reason. bit is it out of control yes right is it going to change it's it there well? and it, I, I would still argue it's done more good than bad i yeah i would agree with that and i think you know especially you know you needed a guy the the rules are going to change as the court system does what it's going to do and laws and the ncaa's existence continually into the future sometimes in doubt and kind of the way that that sets things up. But with the no 
restrictions on two-time transfers and those kind of guys that you can build a better roster quicker this offseason. Oh, and th- this ever. is what I'm totally excited about. I think this is going to be a complete roster overhaul. I think you see maybe two guys. That are so let's go through the, the roster real quick. Let's, let's think about this. 2023-24 WVU basketball roster. So for shits and gigs, let's start with the coaching staff. How many guys do you think DeVries keeps? Uh, I'd be surprised if anyone rolls over. Yeah. So the, it's funny. They already have. Well, I know, I know DeMar Johnson has on, already. On the website. Well, I know Johnson has, you know, has said his goodbyes and, uh, you know, the director. Oh, of wow. Reading. They don't have anyone on here. Yeah, no, yeah, I think I think ben Murray, does. who I think we know, he he's in the athletic department. Yeah, front of the no, I don't know, a distant front of the program. <laughs> Brian Messerly, I, I've seen his face, so I think they're just they just only have people who have been with the athletic department for a while. The entire none of the coaches, GAs, none of them are are on the website, which is interesting. I think there's but, a chance. I think you might see a guy like Alex Ruoff that might yes, stick Yes, I was around. just going to say, you could see an Alex Ruoff or a Deshaun Butler, guys who have been – specifically Ruoff, because Ruoff was a GA under Huggins. He was an assistant this year. He's been working to getting into coaching. That's just like a good olive branch. Like, hey, I'm not from here. Right. Well, and I think – I'm going to hire a legend. You know, Ruoff's not a legend, but he, 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 did, he, right. he, did, he did, uh, did good things at West Virginia. Right, and I think – if you looked at, you know, kind of the knowing that a thing was going to change, that eagle keen eye that you and I have, you know, looked at the staff and even just, you know, a deeper eye than a lot of people have of like watching huddles, you know, having played the game myself, not at a high level, obviously, but, uh, you know, having played the game, you can kind of look at huddles and see the guys that are going to resonate. And Ruoff is one of those guys that can sit in a huddle. He can draw up plays like he's played and played overseas. He's played the game at a high level. So like guys like he, he and Deshaun Butler history. that, right. And he just, you know, has that kind of coaching, you know, and De- Deshaun to a, to a, I think a slightly lesser degree, just because he played at a slightly higher yeah. level, a little bit longer where he's well, still you want to talk about a legend, It is Deshaun Butler. I mean, absolutely. In my lifetime, there's a top one player to play hoops at WVU and it's Deshaun Butler. Right. Top, top the four, close five. The closest, closest players, Javon Carter, and I don't think they're on the same level. No. And even, I think, if you, if you want to go for a third, you know, you're talking a guy like Deuce McBride. Is, is I was going to say Kevin Petsnoggle. Yeah, another uh, – I, I was a ball boy. McBride's a good uh, one, though. On he, he lit it up the other night. Did you see that in the NBA? Yeah, Deuce is uh, is putting it together, and I tell you, I'm disappointed with my abil- my personal ability to read a calendar because one of the games in which Deuce McBride played very well was here in Denver uh, about a week and a half ago. Puts 18 on my Nuggets, and uh, I was not in the building as I should have been. And I'll t- I didn't personal even look as- at that. I should have. Per- personal I got the aside, right down the road. Personal aside here, because Deuce McBride will knock off something that not a lot of people, I think, get to do. I was in Cincinnati, watched a 17-year-old Deuce McBride put up 20 and 8 in a tournament that I was was helping to operate. Watch him in person multiple times in Morgantown. And so he is likely to be, as I don't go to too many high school games these days, uh, likely to be my only opportunity at a three-tier player in person. Yeah, Deuce was awesome. Um, he's not in the Carter Butler camp because he was only there for two years. But if he had been there like a third year, I think he would have been amazing. Like, yeah, in the running for like All American. Yeah. Um, but so let's go through the roster real quick. So Jeremiah Bembry. Redshirt sophomore. I don't know a thing about this dude. Is the first one. Was yeah, he the I guy? think. Yeah, he was the guy from Florida State. Right. I think he 
he might stick around depending on how DeVries likes him because he's long. If I if it's I like remember, eight games. I think he's gone. I yeah, you know, I think he's a guy that you see like some of the guys uh, from the roster last year with the turnover. You see him end up like a Tennessee Tech or, or one of those. Didn't score a single point. Average three minutes. He's gone. Yeah, that's a guy that I think looks at a lower level. Yeah. Um, Noah Farrakhan played pretty well at times. He's a fifth year. I think that means he's he has no more eligibility. I believe I believe he's time. Like I guess let's just kind of go off the top here with guys that we know for sure are done. I'm just going through alphabetical is, order. Right. So I think Farrakhan for sure is out of eligibility or may look elsewhere. Um, then, you know, Jesse Edwards is, is out of eligibility. Um, Raekwon Battle, I believe is out of eligibility. He's going to go overseas. Kirk Creasa has a set, has another year if he wants it. They have, I'm sorry. They have him labeled. I think they, yeah, this is, this is 24, 25. I'm sorry. I thought this was 23, 24. So they've already gotten the roster started for 24, 25 with the, with the DeVries hire. But they have Creasa as a fifth year, and same with Farrakhan. So, so that Farrakhan means Farrakhan's got one more year, year of eligibility. I could see okay. him being back. Right, I could see him because he fits. I think you know guards especially fit DeVries' system very well. So I think you know some of the you know the guards more so than the the bigs. Uh, yeah, I think the forward position is going to be interesting uh, when we get into some of these other guys especially when you're looking at uh you know i guess check me on slazinski's eligibility there because i think he's a name that is probably gone as well so farrakhan averaged 7.7 points per game but he had moments where he led the team in scoring i think he could be back slazinski i would be interested too he's not on the roster i think he's done yeah so right now it's Bembry uh, who, who's on the roster. F- Bembry, Farrakhan, Harris, Johnson, Creasa, Nave. Is that how you pronounce it? Nave. Uh, or Nave. Nave. Ragab. I don't even know. Right. I don't even think he was on uh, scholarship. Sumnik, the football player, T- uh, Tagaloa Nelson, and Seth Wilson. Creasa is the most likely to be back. I would say pretty good shooter. Pretty good shooter. I think he's made some inroads in as far as a connection. And Average 11 just, points per game. Well, I think, too, what you see with Creasa and the NIL games that we've been willing to play with him and stick with him and kind of get making sure that he was taken care of given the international, you know, kind of federal government regulations around NIL kind of things, I think it's harder for him to look elsewhere. And I think, you know, he's certainly a name. And I think there's a couple of names on the roster where if Huggins comes in, you know, not that he's involved because obviously he's not going to be, but I think if Huggins, I don't know that if, if I'm DeVries, you know, I take, I certainly take Huggins call and, oh, yeah, sure. you and just, Right. You, you can't leave a guy like that in the, in the dark with the program. And I think, you know, if you can get hugs to be like, hey, Darian's going to take care of you. And then I'm going to be there like in the shadows, not as far as like, you know, kind of steering the program any one way or the other. Because I don't think Bob Huggins is that kind of guy to kind of do anything, you know, nefarious like that, even in the slightest. But I think, you know, that's the guy where it's like, if Hugs right. says like, all right, I think, you know, you stay here. Like, I'll make sure you get taken care of. And I think Although, wasn't like, it Larry Harrison stuff. who was recruiting against us last, last summer? Like, telling uh, guys to leave? Yeah, I think, like, there were some I, – I had more qualms with Huggins' assistance than I think a lot of people did. I did, too. I, I think he kept some dudes way too long. Right, I think you get especially you know, Ron Everhart. I think really drag drug the program down. Yeah. So our top four scores last year were Battle, Edwards, Slazinski, and Krisa. We've already established Battle, Edwards, and Slazinski are out of eligibility. I would say Krisa is back. Eleven I, I so. points per game. He 
I think played a little hero ball in the limited games that I watched. Probably because like we weren't going yeah. anywhere, and he's like, "I'm just gonna chuck it up." Right. I think if you put him in, well, and I think you look at it too. You get with a better built roster that you're gonna have with yeah. Darian Degrees. I think you get more of Arizona Kirk Creesa mm-hmm. than West Virginia Kirk Creesa because he's like, you know, and it's an interesting attitude that you get from a lot of guys, you know, in athletic situations. Not an ego. I mean, there's a little, there's the egotism that it takes to be successful in a lot of athletic pursuits. And you saw Kirk Creese is like, look, we got no shot unless I put up 12 shots a game or 15. Yeah. So I think he's back. Noah Farrakhan at 7.7 points per game. I think he could be back. Played pretty well at times. Right. I think, I think, I think if Kurt, if Creese is back, I think Farrakhan comes back as you know kind of a batman and robin to start you know the guard position Mm -hmm. and especially when they know that a guy like tucker devries you know when i got a guy that can get me 22 and 8 yeah which is you know what tucker can put up i think guards especially guys like kirk creesa that are assist guys first like he's a pass first guard i i like a guy that can put up 22 and make me you know pad the assist numbers Kobe Johnson averaged six points per game. He's still got eligibility. I would say he's gone. He's been there a couple of years. Hasn't been that impressive when he's played. But the uh, progression's with, not there with, yeah. with him for me. Josiah Harris is next. Now we're getting into dudes who I, I think really are gone. Josiah Harris. I, th- I his- think the, the depth of the roster, guys like, you know, the, the 10 minutes and less guys or guys that on a full roster are getting 10 minutes or less that maybe got 15 this year. Yeah. They see, they see the writing on the wall of like, all right, we're going to have 12 dudes that can play next year. Am I going to be one of those 12? I don't know. Well, Kobe Johnson played 26 minutes a game. That's way too many. Uh, Josiah Harris played 19. He's gone. Pat Sumnick played 14. I think he's gone. He averaged 4.1 points per game. Right, which uh, I tell you, like, and it'll go down in the history of the uh, the degenerate level fan of that one month in the year that will be forgotten, where Pat Sumnick was one of the best players in the Big Twelve for about three weeks, and no one knew what was happening. But was that this year? That was this year. I, like Sumnick, I said, I quit watching after we lost a Monmouth in game two. I was like, shoot, it's gonna be a long year. Well, like, there was a three week stretch right around the Kansas game where Pat Sumnick was like fourteen and eight every night and it was like okay was this the guy that bob huggins was playing two minutes a game because why was bob huggins playing this dude two minutes a game i remember and you're like oh that's why i remember now i remember last year so last year we made the tournament played maryland in uh birmingham my brother lives in huntsville so he drove took work off drove down uh from huntsville to birmingham to watch us and i remember him saying like during that transition where the season was over it was before Bob Huggins got in trouble. We were putting that really good uh, transfer program class together. And I had said something like, could, because we had oversigned players. And I said, could Sumnick be out the door? And my brother was like, I don't know, man. He looked pretty athletic in Birmingham. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, I, I think I'd be willing to take a chance on him, but I, I think he's gone. What about you? Yeah, I think he's a guy that very much like, and uh you know fresh me like a mowagi guy where he, like he has his flashes and he goes to a program i was about to say he did he end have... up in alabama he's yeah he was uh he was on my tv when we started i was uh... just thinking that like yes uh no today's sunday so friday i saw the name wagi and i was like there's no way that that's not the same wagi that played at west virginia yeah no i've watched alabama several times this this season and yeah i was like yeah okay you know Good for you getting out of town, I guess. But like, I think that's a a program, not Alabama specifically, of course, necessarily. But you know, that's a you know a Sumnick type role where you can go to a place like Alabama where they just need a dude to play the dunker spot. Yeah. Next up, this is a guy. I'm going to do my Chris Collinsworth here. This is a guy I was kind of getting excited about last year. Looked like he was ascending. And Seth Wilson, he came in a, a little bit last year, like made some th- didn't play a ton, but like would make some threes every now and then. Like, you know, wouldn't be uncommon for him to make 
two or three threes in a game coming off the bench. He averaged third. I'm sorry, three and a half points per game last year, 17 minutes, played 28 games. He is a senior, probably has another year of eligibility. I don't know with the COVID redshirt. I think he's pro- likely gone, but which is a shame. I was kind of excited about where he was heading. Yeah, and I think he's a name that I think a lot of people, you know, this year I think it's kind of tough to you get the guys that are like, play well based on their motivation. And this is not a ding on Seth Wilson because you, you know, you and I have been on athletic teams in our lives where you just knew, look, we're, yeah. we're bad. We're bad. And I think like that's, it's tough to judge some guys. So I think he still has some upward trajectory and I'd be happy if he sticks around because I think when you give him, a, you know, where he can look in a room with, you know, 12, 15 guys, be like, we can go win some ball games with yeah. this, with this group of guys. I think he's a guy that shows up and get you eight or 10. And so I think, you know, he might, he probably goes elsewhere in this portal happy world in which we're living in. But, you know, he's a name that I'd like to see play on a team that's got a chance. So this guy doesn't have any eligibility left, but I, I think if he did, he would be back and it's a cook, a cook. Crazy athlete, mm-hmm. big dude. Unfortunately, just a really, really unfortunate situation yeah. this year for him. I think he would be back, but he doesn't have any more eligibility. Yeah. Uh, Offrey Neve averaged 2.6 points per game, played 24 games, averaged a little under 14 minutes. What's his eligibility? He's only a, he's only going to be he's a young guy. I could see him returning just because he's young. Yeah, I think, and that, but he's in that that forward yeah. room that I think is going to be interesting to see how DeVries, at least this year, kind of approaches that room. Depending, and I have to look because I know DeVries is very free flowing offense where he needs two forwards as opposed to a you know four out one in kind of style of play where he needs you know, kind of those athletic wing types and somebody that can guard the post. I I don't know that Offrey's that guy that can play, like he's a three, maybe a four, you know, in a small ball situation where I think, you know, you kind of look at, you know, does Tucker DeVries want to play the five on on defense? I don't know that that's the case. Uh, You know, have that depth of a knowledge on his style of play just yet but i think you know offer is a guy that could stick around if the role is right and you know give him a chance to develop and kind of maybe learn from tucker a little bit so <clears throat> 10 scholarship players currently on the roster you get 13 in men's basketball we gave <clears throat> two of those 10 that i think could be back i I would be 50 50 on whether or not they would be back maybe a little bit higher but i would say we try i would like to see us try to retain them in farrakhan and creesa so that would mean eight guys leave you got three open scholarships that's 11 guys who could come in that's a stupid number so i'm willing to bet some of these guys are going to stick around yeah i think i think when you look at that high of a number because the transfer class this year pre Huggins situation in the in the summer last year excuse me was seven or eight guys and that felt like a massive overhaul let's see, let's see if 247 has it because I know some uh, some of those guys didn't stick with West Virginia or did they and we just had guys leave like who were already on the roster. Yeah, and there, and there, there were some defections, you know, kind of early in the, the spring last year. So in 2023, there was Creesa, Jose Perez, Omar Silverio, and Jesse Edwards, Raekwon Battle, and then that was it. So 
one, two, three, four, five. There were about five guys, maybe six, that Huggins brought in. And right. that was a lot. That was leading the country. All right. And you're talking about one. you're talking about doubling that. I think at a certain point, if I'm DeVries, I'm doing everything I can to keep probably four or five guys to give me some depth, give me that cultural yeah. transition just for this year. And then, you know, maybe you have to bring in another five next year. You know, I think that that's got to, it's got to be a multi-year. I think you can bring in the, you can bring in your starting five for next year. Keep some guys for, for depth. I couldn't even tell you the starting five. Well, so I think there's no way, like we're talking, this is going to be after you and I going to have to put this one together, you know, in the, you know, our preseason uh, preview in, you know, September and kind of see where the roster looks like before we can even pretend to play that game, you know, two hours on from a coaching hire. So, yeah, 10 guys remain. My guess is probably half are gone. Probably. Yeah, I think I think you keep four or five for sure. I think that's fair. And then that leaves about eight spots left for transfers, and that that's a reasonable number. If we signed about six last year, eight's not ridiculous. Right, and I think you're still going to have some, uh, you know, freshmen too. You can find some. True. Uh, because we do have a, a guard who said out of the 2024 class that uh, out of Ohio, I'm forgetting his name. You know, kind of a three star guy who said I'm gonna. He's like I'm. Who was on with West Virginia, already signed, and had a good relationship with Coach Eilert. And, you know, it was where Coach Eilert went right after the season before he was told that he wouldn't be retained and was kind of just shoring up next year's class as best he, that he could given the circumstances. And, you know, all of those recruits from what I've seen, all, like there's only two of them that were signed for next year, said, hey, I'm going to wait and see. You know, Coach Eilert said we're going to be in a good spot, whether it's him or somebody else. And that's, again, a, another element to that professionalism with Coach Eilert. He knew probably by mid-January that this was his last shot, but he said, I'm going to coach. He's, you know, his guy said, I'm going to coach this out until they tell me the paychecks aren't coming. And he did, he did everything he could to try and set everything up. And I I think the fan base owes him a a debt of gratitude for continuing to coach until coach DeVries came in. I would agree with that. What, What do you think the chances are he stays on the staff? I would say very slim. I, I I don't see, given the way that, you know, this – and it's not even the way that this year went. You know, I think he stays around the program potentially or, you know, he might get you know, get some uh, lower, you know, mid-major jobs that are looking for a guy to be like, hey, like I got a year's worth of tape on this guy. I think he can win in the, the MEAC, you know, and see if, he's, if he wants to take a step up and get a full-time job somewhere uh you know he's got a you know two decades worth of coaching experience there's going to be some ad's that are like hey how's you know i'll pay you 250 a year if you can come back you know you want to take this on you know at a lower level i don't know whether he says yes or no to that you know i'll leave that up to coach Eilert to make his career choices but i think that's a position i could see him going to i can't believe you brought this up and i couldn't believe it when you said it like I did a double take and then I told my family the same thing. And they were also stunned that Darian DeVries will be our fourth coach for fourth since the late seventies. That's pretty incredible. We have gone through right. three coaching searches since the late seventies and only two in our lifetime. Next you had Gail Catlett from the seventies to what was that? Oh, it was 2002. Oh, one? Oh, oh, two. Okay. And so it's like, all right, so there's, you know, 20 plus years of, right. of Coach Catlett, a decade. The good, of, the almost 30 of that or four, close to 40 is taken up by Catlett and Huggins. Right. And, you know, with a little bit of beeline in there. But it's honestly pretty incredible. Like, and, and it's not yeah. dissimilar in football. I mean, since the 80s, it's been Nealon, Rodriguez, Stewart, Holgerson, Brown. Five and forty some years. Yeah. So pretty incredible. Uh, well, and I tell you, like, and that's I think something that 
is getting a little bit overlooked because he was picking just from the cream of the crop, which just happens to be, you know, usually younger guys that you can build a program with. But Darian DeVries is 48. Still a relatively young. young guy. I would like to have gone younger, but still pretty young. All right, but, you know, relatively young as far as coaching standards go. He's a guy you can get a decade with if he wants to stick around and do well. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'll be honest. I, I was kind of at a point where I wanted to move on from Huggins. Just... I, I think it had fallen off a little bit, and it's not even really – Huggins' fault in a in a lot some ways I wouldn't say a lot of ways but in some ways mm-hmm. just with the the landscape in which Coach Huggins was extremely successful was a very you know a high power structure situation where you knew he had your back but he was the coach I don't think he adjusted as well as a guy like Coach K to the new kind of NIL player empowerment era. And I think that had fallen off where Huggins always had to get his guys. It it was kind of a way that we always understood it. And we knew who those guys were. The problem that coach Huggins, I think had run into in the last five to seven years was with the NIL era and transfers and stuff. There wasn't as much reason like the, the amount of, you know, Huggins guys that exist in the, the high school and transfer portal was shrinking year by year. And I don't think that number was ever going to get away where like Huggins was going to get enough of his own guys to be consistently a top tier program. He was going to hit on guys. He was going to get every couple of years. If Huggins was coached until, you know, 2050, you know, you're going to have every four or five years, you're going to hit on a Javon Carter that you see playing on court eight at the AAU tournament and pair him with a Daxter Miles, and you're going to have a dominant two years. You're going to find a Deuce McBride who just you know happened to play at a really good program in your backyard, and you know had some connections to Cincinnati era that you know was able to come to Morgantown. You're going to get a guy like that every couple of years, but you weren't going to be you know 20 wins every year. You're going to miss the tournament two out of every five years, the way that Coach Huggins was forced to recruit and adapt. So <clears throat> he takes us to the final four in 2010. And then 2010, 2011, the next year, we kind of knew it would be a bit of a rebuilding year, but we still returned quite a bit of guys from that team and we went to the tournament. But then the next two years, it was pretty rough, or three years, it was pretty rough. We did make the tournament in 2011, 2012, and Kevin, with mostly because of Kevin Jones. Yeah. And then the first two years in the Big East were rough. Or I'm sorry, Big 12 were rough. And I remember that 2014 team, oddly enough, I thought was going to be pretty good. And then we lost uh, – I don't even remember who they were now. Eric Harris, was that one of them? Harrison? Uh, what was his uh, name? Eric. Eric Murray? No, he was the big man. It was a guard. He went to play for Izzo at Michigan State. Was there – no, not Terry Rozier. He played for the Celtics. There was a Terry in there too. I'll look it up. Yeah, I mean, the, the only Michigan State I remember, the you know, the whiff on uh, – I believe it was Denzel – not Denzel Valentine. Uh, the other big that, uh, you know, his career blew up. No. who? What were their names? Eric – maybe it wasn't Eric, but I thought it was. Uh, Aaron, I'm sorry, Aaron Harris. Uh, yeah, I remember and Terry yeah, he Henderson some, were the two, and right? And then that, that, well, they left under some uh questionable yeah. situation. Well, I didn't I know say. about that, but I thought that 2014 15 team was but gonna be good. Those I, two transfer out, and I'm like, what the hell are we doing? Like, Huggins has to go, and then that year we bring in. Uh, Daxter Miles, we bring in Javon Carter as true freshman, and Press Virginia is born, and we go on a really good run there for four years, and I'm like, okay, we're back. Huggins has his, you know, ha- has his groove back. And then since then, it's been some ups and some downs. Like, we were pretty good with Deuce McBride, and then you have like 2021-22 season, where it was a whole bunch of guys who weren't on the same page. Right, and I, yeah, I think yeah, you know, like I said, 
when you're talking about, you know, Huggins kind of struggling, uh, Aaron Harris and Terry Henderson, it didn't really come to a whole lot of fruition while they were in Morgantown. But if you followed their careers the year or two after, I believe Terry Henderson went to NC State. Yeah. And Aaron Harris, I forget where he landed. He went to Michigan they, State. He went to Michigan State. And, you know, Harris didn't really get along with Izzo, uh, from what I recall. And Terry Henderson, I believe, had some uh, legal troubles uh, catch up with him in, in Raleigh. Now that you and, mention that, that does ring a bell. And so I, I think, think like, those are the guys where, like, you know, Huggins always tries to recruit those junkyard dogs, and sometimes you get the junkyard dogs from the wrong junkyard. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. It, it, it just got to a point where, it, I mean, the relationship I thought was a little stale. Like, I was like, Bobby, are we just right. going to be good – every other year because i kind of don't want that and even when we were good i still thought we were very flawed like even when we made the tournament in 2023 and i like the guys on that team eric stevenson in my book is a i don't want to say an all-time mountaineer but a fan favorite mountaineer as far as i'm concerned right. love the dude only there for one year and he you know meant a lot to the program but we were only 19 and 15 i believe when it was all said and done Right. So I was still, you know, we're still really not that great of a team when we're right. good. And then we're really bad when we're bad. So I was kind of ready to move on. But this brings me up to a, another point. How involved do you think Huggins is going to be? Yeah, I think it depends on whether he's able to get another job in the in the short term. Which I don't I think, think yeah, I don't think he's going to. I think, you know, you're going to have to find somebody that's going to want to take a chance on him and take the PR hit. It, it's going to come a little bit. But I well, think he's he just kind of sits in the shadows. I think Morgantown is home for him. He doesn't need to work another day in his life. I think he'll do, you know, he'll do well uh, in whatever he wants to do to kind of help the university, you know, maybe takes a year off from everything. He need well, he's already taken a year off. Well, uh, you know, fair, but I think, you know, kind of year out of the spotlight. Yeah, I think I think he leaves DeVries to, to do his own thing. I don't think he's in the, you know, in the front row at the Coliseum next year at all. And so I think, you know, he kind of leaves DeVries into, into the next era and, you know, supports from the shadows, which I, I think what the program ultimately needs. So he'll be 71 this year. He's older than I thought. And I don't think he's getting a job this cycle. Let's pretend it's next year. It's he'll be seventy-two. Yeah. I don't know very many seventy-two guys getting high-profile jobs. No, yeah, I don't think he gets another high-profile job. I think I don't either. I think, he I knows think it would have good. to be like a mid-major or something. Right. Maybe Marshall. <laughs> Talk about uh, sticking yeah, no. West Virginia. That would be funny. But right. I, agree. I think he's still pretty butt hurt about the way things ended, even though it was his own undoing. Right. And I think, I think if you read, you know, read how he's approached it, he understands, I think given some time to separate himself from the reality of what happened is he understands where it is. And I think he's ready to not let bygones be bygones, but be willing to own up to what happened and be like, hey, yeah, like I put West Virginia in a bad spot and, you know, I'm willing to do what I have to do to be, you know, the best person I can be in my personal life and for, for the state of West Virginia. He, he, he needs to just call it quits. Like, I think it's so. over. It's over. You got to the Hall of Fame. Great. That's what we all wanted. But it's over. Like, it's time to move on. Right. And how long do you think before he, he gets involved? Uh, I think I, he's still going to be kind of distant. Like, I, I, I think, think he'll still be still see him, but I think he's going to be a little butthurt. It's going gonna, it's gonna to take a minute, but I think, I think it will happen because even Ren and Bob have had those discussions that will remain in the, the, the annals of Ren's office. It's annals. 
<laughs> so anyone call me out on that. <laughs> but I thought you were joking there for a second. I was like, he's doing, he's pronouncing that on purpose. I was like, and then you can't just kept going. I was like, but I you know, really that, it, man, it's anal's. <laughs> But, you know, I think I think those discussions will remain, you know, private for, for all parties. But I think they've had those discussions on what the next chapter looks like. Well, I've always heard that whenever he hung it up, that he had a spot in the athletic department for him. Yeah, that was it. That was what in that lifetime I mean, contract. Yeah. I would say I would imagine that that ship has probably sailed. I, I would be inclined to agree in the short term. I don't know if Ren maybe, you know, when everyone has a chance and cooler heads settle down in two or three years, if coach still wants to be involved, yeah. that, you know, potentially he comes back when he's 74, 75, just as like a retirement, you know, thing to kind of help. Like I said, I think, you know, I mentioned a little bit ago, I think really his future is quasi related in that, you know, he takes some time away from the program, truly dedicates himself to to working on his uh, admitted issues, self-admitted, and comes back in a, a leadership capacity or at least a producer capacity with the Country Roads Trust and really kind of sets up the university as a whole for success and not so much being directly involved with basketball matters. I mean, I would love if, you know, one day he's like uh, an assistant to the head coach, you know, like Josh Eilert had someone on his staff this year that was kind of like that, an assistant to him. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that's ever going to happen. But I don't, yeah, I don't think you see him on the sideline ever again. I don't I don't think so either. But if I'm Darian DeVries, my first call is should probably be to Bob Huggins and just say like, hey, man, I know it ended – Maybe not the first call, but one of your first calls needs to be to Bob Huggins. All right. When he's in Morgantown this weekend, like, I, I think. Didn't end well here, but you are welcome to stop by. Like, you you mean too much to this program. And, again, it's just an olive branch. Darian DeVries is an outsider. To, to a lot of West Virginia fans, he's going to be seen as an outsider. And, you know. Well, and I think, I think the, you know, the guys that you need to make friends with are Bob Huggins. Yes. And, you know, Coach Beeline is, you know, separated himself no, a little no. bit, you know, to where I'm not sure that he's a call that you make anymore. No. But those are the kind of guys where you need to be like, hey, you know, and Ren's going to help with that. And who do I need to know? And what do I need to do to be successful here? What, you know, kind of those like when you're getting trained on the new job, you know, in yeah. your in your your business life is like, all right. Who's the who's the guy I need to stay away from? Who's the guy I need to be friends with? Who's gonna you know who are you know guys that have helped you like? And oddly enough, reason. oddly enough, Bob Huggins is both. <laughs> stay away from him, but also you need him. <laughs> right, I think yeah, but I think and obviously Coach DeVries successful in his own right. He's gonna do and have his own network right. of people that made him successful, and it's kind of just those you know those dinner conversations that, that you need to have a little bit, uh, you know, I'll leave the, you know, the references to, you know, you know, over a beer uh, that aren't in, aren't in good taste given the, the transition of what's happened, but, you know, kind of those, those casual conversations of just hanging out, you know, talking hoops, like, Hey, what do I need to do? You know, what, what's worked well. And, you know, those are conversations that you don't get too often outside of coaching yeah. that I think, you know, you can have those conversations. Is Gil Catlett still alive? That was going to be a reference I was going to make, but I didn't want to make that without understanding and remembering so. that. I do believe I remember no, he his. Is. He is? He's 83. I would talk to him too. I would also talk to Jay Jacobs. Yeah, Long time play by play guy from Morgantown. Did he play at WVU? Yes. I think he so, was yeah. he was in that uh he was a, a role guy, I believe, back in the, the hot rod Hunley days. I would talk to all three and be like, hey man, you know, what do I need to know here? 
You got to always have a spot in my program. If you want to swing by, watch practice, whatever. I mean, Neil Brown talks about that all the time. You know, just, right. hey, you always have a spot here. Yeah, and I think that, and that's another, you know, guy coming in from, you know, essentially the outside. That's another call that, like, I mean, they're going to get put in the same room time and time again. Those are guys they are going to be good friends, whether they like it or not. But I think Neil Brown's another guy. And Coach Maisie came in from the outside as well. Yeah, I would talk to him too. Right, like you get – like, talk you know, about a fan base guys, that has embraced him, even though he is not – well, he kind of is. He's from just right across the, the border in Pennsylvania. He kind of is one of us. Right. And I think, but I think too, it's like Maisie's career trajectory yeah. and career track. I think a lot of people forget where he's from. True. I think people associate him with Texas because he was an assistant at TCU before we hired him. Correct. Yeah. I think that's where a lot of people are like, oh, he's a TCU guy. It's like, eh, well, yes, that's, you know, but, you know, as they say, country roads will, will take all of us home. I'm really excited, man. Uh, just feels like Christmas morning, just about like okay. You, you know, you and I, you I mean, and I are making the jokes. It's a good one, like it's a good candidate. Well, and I think you and I are making the jokes of like you know, it feels like Christmas morning, Thursday and Friday, the NCAA yeah. tournament. Oh, but dude, you know, we got a we got days, a pretty good New Year's present. These last two days have sucked, and not because of my bracket or anything. Like, it is truly a step down from the first two days of the tournament. I'm just like, what time did the game start? Okay, 11, sweet, pretty early. And then, you know. Just being able to only watch two games. Oh, it's just one game right now. When do I get that? Oh, not until the evening? Yeah, that's the the struggle for all of us is going from watching four games at a time to uh, my only multi-view option today being the – two overlapping men's games and the premier women's game on ESPN is my, my triplicate, which the women's tournament, uh, very chalky first round, but uh, 31 and one, if you pick the chalk in the first round, it always is chalk. Like if you take one seeds every year in the women's bracket, you're going to be right the bulk of the time. Right. And then, you know, I think we kind of having our, anxiety level brought down significantly with a fantastic coaching hire we can look forward to uh, letting everyone you know relax listen to us and get ready for jj quinterly versus caitlin clark tomorrow night whatever house <laughs> money as far as i'm concerned yeah i didn't even i didn't even watch the, the princeton game um i should uh, i haven't watched the women's yeah. team all year i really should watch them yeah, there's going to be a lot, of, a lot of eyeballs on this one, and I think, uh, you know, we got two good coaches for the foreseeable future. I think we're good to go. Yeah. I mean, we'll see with football, but I really like DeVries. I really like Kellogg. Like, I'm, I'm all in, man. I'm excited. I hope, I hope the donors are too, because I remember, you know, that report, what, in February about – how ha- it was something like most of the donors are making a run for Bob to rehire Bob Huggins. And I was like, Oh no. Oh no. But, and that's Bob? that I think, I think you're going to get uh, like, that's where I think that that dinner conversation with Huggins and DeVries, you know, having that kind of, you know, let's talk it out. You know, not like a bad breakup or anything between what? those two, but just like a, Hey, you know, what do I need to do? Coach Kendrick or Ken Kendrick. Uh, well, it was honestly, be... it wasn't until he spoke where I, feel, he was like, are we insane? He's like, are we insane? We're going to rehire this guy. <laughs> right. And I think, I think when you have that donor network is incredibly tight yeah. historically, I think, you know, Ken Kendrick's going to kind of help with that. I think, you know, when rubber meets the road, Coach Huggins is going to make sure that West Virginia is successful and do what he needs to do where, you know, obviously those donors are very well entrenched in relationships with Coach Huggs. And I think, you know, the guys that are, you know, 
hugs or, or hell kind of guys, I think Coach Huggins is, you know, going to be on the phone with those guys and be like, hey, is it West Virginia or is it me? I'm not bigger than the program. I think Huggins will get to that eventually. He might even do it right now. I but, think he will. Yeah. I, I, I think he will right now. If you, if you, if you press me enough, I think Coach Huggins does that right now. I think he's that, that type of a man. I could see it. Like, I, I truly do think he loves West Virginia that much. But we'll see. I'm excited, man. I really am. I need to check up on some of this news. There, I've, I've gotten so many updates. Yeah, we got we a lot of catching up to do. I do, and, and it's, this it's went on way do. longer than what I thought it would. I was like, we'll wrap this up in 45 minutes, and we've Mate, done nope. that. It's all good. Uh, I'm fine going long on good news. And, and this is great news. I'm really excited about the pro- future of the program, you know. In the summer, you know, I, I, I've all, I'm always curious about, and this goes back to what I was saying earlier, which names come up? Because I think we have very respectable football programs and basketball programs. And, you know, there are people in the fan base who argue that we're a basketball school. I'm not sure I agree with that. Do you? You know, I've been one of those guys where I think the, the depth of success is deeper on the basketball side. I feel like we're more well-known for that. Here's the thing. Like, I can't really argue. Like, I don't agree, but I'm like, if I'm, you think fi- it's I'm, I'm, like, I'm yeah, glad I that that's a – well, and I'll tell you that this has always been my feeling on it. I'm glad it's the discussion. Yeah. I'm glad it's the discussion because a lot of schools, it's not. Ask, ask guys in Durham, North Carolina, how they feel about that discussion. Anybody argue on that? I'm glad to have a discussion, a legitimate discussion. Um, There was something else I was going to add. But anyway, you know, I'm always curious about what names come up for our jobs. Because like I said, I, I think we're respectable programs. I think coaches and this is clear based on my rant earlier in this podcast but uh i think coaches respect this these programs you know they're willing to come here they know it's a challenge but they're willing to come here and but in the summer when i was seeing the likes of andy kennedy and jared calhoun i was like you've got to be kidding me we can't get someone better than those two options and those two options only came up because they were huggins assistance yeah. and I, I was seriously like there's no way that's the best we can do and here we are a, uh, right. almost april late march and um we get the second best option maybe the best option on the board yeah and i think that's and we're yeah. not even a top two opening we were the fourth in my opinion right we we jumped i think louisville would love to have him and i'm glad he, i I'm think glad that's a credit to Rim Baker. i really do yeah and i think you know given us reason to you know, have such a lengthy discussion about good news and be looking forward. Like, I think a lot of people were kind of looking forward to next year just because this year was going to be so poor. But, you know, have a legitimate reason to look forward to October. Yeah, I I love just new hires, you know. Like, when we hired Neil Brown, like, I was super excited, obviously, because he did well at Troy. But I was like, I want to see what kind of staff he puts together. I want to see who he brings in. It just brings a whole new level of excitement. And yeah. same with DeVries. I'm like, I want to see what kind of staff mm-hmm. he puts together. The next, who, the next few weeks are going to be a lot to look forward to. It's going to be a lot of fun. I, and then, you know, then it becomes what kind of rosters is he going to put together. And we already kind of know he's going to bring his son, who is a, you know, Missouri Valley player of the year. Really exciting. They say an NBA prospect. Who knows? Don't really care. Just a good player. You know, going to be a lot of fun these next few weeks. I'm like, I, I, I can't think enough. I'm excited. Yep. And that's, you know, when we get excited, we get to talking. So an hour and a hour and a half is a good thing to to talk about. So I, I, I got one more question. Uh, actually, a couple more questions real quick. Who do you think Oklahoma State and Louisville hire? Because now I am interested because, you know, I was telling you and my family, I'm like, who are they were like, who are they going to hire? I'm like, don't know, don't care. I want Darian DeVries. And now like, we got him. I'm like, well, now I wonder who they're going to get. Well, I, and I told an Oklahoma State fan at the office, I said, keep your hands off my DeVries. That's mine. You can have – you can have And you else. said he didn't know who that was, right? And, and a lot of the fan base didn't know. But then, you know, those the, power, the, the people in the know knew that he was the name they wanted. I've seen some – I had some conversations, you know, after – you know, on the kind of the message boards about DeVries hire to Morgantown. 
they're like, well, let's go get Danny Sprinkle. And I said, mm, well, Danny Sprinkle is linked very heavily. I've he's seen imminent, imminent announcements tomorrow, potentially with him yeah. in Washington, which puts, you know, I've seen some, you know, oh, let's hire an assistant from, you know, some Big 12 staffs. Like, I think you're going to get, you know, I think Oklahoma State ultimately goes with, you know, a Jerome Tang kind of hire. Yeah, I agree. Find, find someone like that. Louisville, I could see a, a Medved. I don't know that he's got the connection there uh, as strongly. Yeah. Uh, I think Medved might just end up staying put this this mm-hmm. cycle and see if he can but repeat this year. the options are year. getting limited. Like, I- the options are very limited for Oklahoma State, and I think Louisville's an interesting situation. I've seen uh, Holloway and Abdur Rahim – are two names to watch there. Yeah, and who Pat is Raheem? Kelsey. You mentioned him earlier today. He he is you know he's a deep cut you know guy from uh, I believe it's Kennesaw State to USF takes USF to their best season in a long time if not ever uh, you know good run oh, in the right. AAC and so I think you know he's a he's an up and coming name that I don't think was ready for you know Morgantown. Oh, I but, actually just thought of a name for both schools. The dude at Western Kentucky. Yeah, I think he's a name that's one of those not quite there guys. I think possibly, but I mean, he's been a head coach think, for years, three straight NCAA t- tournament appearances at two different schools. I think that's impressive. Yeah, I, I think you and I get, did well to to pick West Virginia's hire. I I don't have a specific name, but I you know, like I said, that's the profile I think Oklahoma State goes for is like a Jerome Tang, you know, a Big Twelve assistant. I think is who they ultimately go for because they're running out of head coaching names. And then I think even though it's not a great fit and I think will ultimately not last more than two or three years, Pat Kelsey is getting a lot, a lot of talk in Louisville circles in the last you know, 48 hours that I've seen. I think that so would I be think, a really good cultural fit. He's from Ohio, has a lot of ties to Cincinnati. Cincinnati, Louisville aren't that far apart. Hour and a half. Yeah. I, I can see bounds. that. That's a big jump, though, from College of Charleston. To- right. I think I – think, Culturally perfect basketball fit. Will the powers that be in the Louisville donor circles and the powers that be in the administration give him enough of a chance? Because I think Louisville's coming because of the lack of success with Kenny Payne. I think they're a little more patient, maybe with with a guy like Pat Kelsey than they would have been if he was the higher last you know last cycle that they were looking. But I think Kenny Payne only got the second year because of who he was. If Pat Kelsey goes another seven and 20 type season, I don't think he gets a second year, but I think he's a guy that's going to get you 15 in the first year, hopefully for them. All right. I've taken up enough of your time. I got to make dinner. I appreciate you coming on Dylan. We had great news to discuss. Like, Within, you know, 30 minutes of that announcement, I, I was like, dude, we got to do a podcast tonight, like right this second. Right. We can't can't be waiting on that. So you got you got some dinner to make. I got a wife on her own with that 11 in the spare bedroom for two hours. So uh, yeah, you, you <laughs> definitely got to get going. <laughs> yes, sir. All right, my man. I appreciate you coming on. Absolutely. Go Mountaineers. Go Mountaineers.